Would you pray with me? Come, Holy Spirit, and fill the hearts of these your faithful, and kindle within us the fire of your love. And may my words and our hearts together glorify you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. During the years 1768 through 1771, as the storm clouds of war were gathering over the 13 colonies of the New World, the first English language encyclopedia, the Encyclopedia Britannica, was being created and was first published in three volumes in Edinburgh, Scotland. Written and continuously updated by 100 full-time editors and more than 4,000 contributors who included 110 Nobel Prize winners and five American presidents, the Encyclopedia Britannica has been regarded as among the most scholarly of English language encyclopedias. Still, in March of last year, Britannica's leadership announced that they would not produce any new print editions of the encyclopedia and that the 2010 15th edition was its last. It was a watershed moment, <clears throat> and yet, as with most overnight changes, the movement toward this decision had been on track for years. As time and expense required for the updates produced a resource already out of date upon delivery, and as their method of door-to-door -door sales produced increasingly smaller profits, the company knew they had to change. The publishers rightly desired to honor their long history and reputation for rigor and accuracy. However, they could not ignore that their previous delivery system no longer worked. Britannica's efforts to use new technologies had begun years ago with some modest successes, but mostly failures. Still, instead of seeing Wikipedia and other online resource engines as rivals, Instead of viewing their past failures as the end of the road, the leadership at Britannica learned from the past and from others so that a new model could emerge. Focus less on product and more on learning. The new approach of Britannica Online, built on their reputation in providing a range of learning resources for K through 12 teachers and students. And today, the company is growing even as it changes. <clears throat> Their leadership believes that they have been able to handle challenge after challenge by honoring their history, by honoring their deeply held sense of mission, even as the ways of carrying out that mission change regularly. Do you hear that? They honored a deeply held sense of mission even as the way of carrying out that mission was changing. And the question for us tonight is, can we do that? Can we, who have the greatest mission in the world, the mission of proclaiming and witnessing to God's radically inclusive love, revealed in Jesus our Christ, and sustained by the Holy Spirit, can we do that? And can we, the United Church of Christ, with our great history and our great mission to proclaim the love of a still speaking God who now stand at another new beginning with our one governance structure, can we do that? Can we honor our history and step boldly into the future even as the ways of carrying out our mission change regularly? This is a watershed moment for our church, even 
though it has been in the making for more than a decade. And I want to remind you that change, even good change, be brings with it certain challenges and inevitable frustrations and fears. Still, this evening, thank you, I invite you. This evening, I invite you to hold fast to the mission of Jesus Christ, to bring good news to the poor, proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and proclaim the year of our Lord's favor. I want to invite you to hold fast to the history and mission of our great church, our church uniquely called to be a church of extravagant welcome, prophetic witness, a church that is changing lives and by changing those lives are participating in bringing about the very realm of God on the face of the earth. And you see, Jesus was always doing that kind of thing, I think, focused on his mission, yet he was always surprising people with his new ways of understanding their lives, their faith, their way of being God's people in the world. So, is it any wonder that when Jesus called 70 people to become his disciples, that he was trying a new delivery method? Instead of his followers being locked behind the walls of a synagogue or temple, bound by the rigidity of 613 Mosaic laws, he sent them out into the world to be among the people, to prepare the way where he himself intended to go. And there is much to learn from Jesus' instructions to the 70. There was a sense of urgency in what he told them with Jesus asking the 70 to pray for more laborers. Now let me ask you, who among us here tonight hadn't prayed for more laborers? <laughs> who among us haven't prayed for that? And who is it among us tonight that doesn't feel the urgency facing the church in today's world where the nuns not the N-U-N-S, the nuns, the N-O-N-E-S, those who are spiritual but unaffiliated with any religious organization are the fastest growing self-identified faith group in America today. But listen, Jesus told those early disciples that the harvest is plentiful. You see, Jesus was undaunted by the rejections and the challenges he faced. He had turned his face to Jerusalem to fulfill his mission, and now he was empowering those 70 whom he has called to join in his mission to see plentitude rather than scarcity. And perhaps that is just what we need to hear today as well. If we were to engage those in our communities who are hungry for a new way of seeing and understanding, what it is to be the church. If we were to offer the nuns, and not just them, but all those good Christian people who have fled the church, fed up with church fights filled with judgment and hate, might we actually be the ones now today preparing a place for the very place that Christ wants to go? If we did, I believe that you and I and all of us all of us would quickly discover that plentitude trumps scarcity every single time. <clears throat> the truth then is the truth now. The harvest is plentiful and Jesus needs us, needs you and me to let go of our fears of scarcity, of being small, of being different, and grab hold of the plentitude that Jesus calls us to. And that's not the only lesson Jesus offered to those who he sent out into the world. Jesus' mission was holistic, curing, preaching, teaching, and no doubt this mission took those 70, and no less us, into direct conflict with those who disagree with our mission. 
Even so, Jesus said that we are to go peaceably, proclaiming that the whole realm of God is near. And Jesus told them, and no less us, that they were going to be lambs in the midst of wolves. This sending forth by Jesus meant that they would need to have courage and yet be utterly and completely vulnerable. They were to travel light and depending on the hospitality of others. And I think about that and I think, I think about how Jesus didn't tell them what to pack, he told them what not to pack. And I just would like to say that it would be much easier on all of us as we board our planes home tomorrow if we paid attention to that. The question is, what baggage are we carrying into the future? What baggage are we collectively carrying into a new beginning as a church? What do we need to unpack and leave behind so that we can go forward together while at the same time honoring our history and our mission? What do we all need to leave behind in order to be the church of Jesus Christ, a church ever reforming in Christ's image, honoring our history and mission, but ever searching for new ways of delivering our message. But listen, this is the exciting part, I think. You see, Jesus told those 70 that they were called to be shalom to those they met to be nonviolent responders when they faced rejection. Because if they did that, if they could answer any rejection by wiping the dust from their shoes and moving on, then they would actually be living, breathing, the living, breathing presence of the truth of the realm of God come near. You see, don't you? If the mission is carried out as Jesus compels us, with its rejection of worldly power, status, and wealth, the harvest will then be about how we, you and I and all of us, come into full maturity and are gathered up into the realm and reign of God. Now, the truth of the matter is that for many of us, the urgency of our mission will dim with the passage of time. We will leave this place where we have been with our people, where we have been inspired to be a better church, where we have been inspired to be better people, and we will step back into a world, well, perhaps filled with wolves. We will risk slipping back into our complacency, and though the challenges we have met here in Long Beach will still be present, they will move to the corners of our mind as we face the challenges of our day-to-day -day living. We may well find ourselves believing what the world would have us believe, that we can never make much of a difference. The problems are too much, and the world is too big, and we could never really ever change things. And you may be like me, not very excited about being a sheep among wolves. You ask, who am I to be called forth into the world as a witness of Jesus Christ? Who am I to be called forth into the world as a witness of the realm of God coming near? But consider this. Noah was a drunk. Abraham was old. Isaac was a daydreamer, Jacob was a liar, Rachel was conniving, Moses couldn't talk, Gideon was afraid, Samson was a womanizer, Rahab was a prostitute, Jeremiah was a whiner, David had an affair, Elijah was suicidal, Isaiah preached naked, Jonah ran from God, Naomi was a widow, Job lost everything, John the Baptist ate bugs, Peter denied Jesus. The disciples fell asleep, Martha worried about everything, Mary Magdalene was possessed of demons, Zacchaeus was too small, Paul was too religious, Timothy was too young, and Lazarus was dead. <laughs> and
And yet, God used every one of them. Every last one of them. So might it be, could it be, that God could use you and me as well? Might we be counted among the 70? Can we honor our history and a deeply held sense of mission, even as the way of carrying out our mission changes? Can we believe with our hearts and minds and very souls in plentitude rather than scarcity? Can you pray to the Lord of the harvest? You know, I'm a person who often wakes up in the wee hours of the morning. Actually, I could set my clock by it, 3 a.m. And I will confess that I turn on the television. And I am a little bit obsessed with the infomercials. Of course, among the very first infomercials ever made was that for the Ginsu knife. In Japan, the hand can be used like a knife. But this method doesn't work with a tomato. That's why we use the Ginsu. Ginsu can cut a slice of bread so thin you can almost see through it. It cuts meat better than an electric knife and goes through frozen food as though it were melted butter. The Ginsu is so sharp it can cut through a tin can and still slice a tomato like this. But wait, there's more. Since the Ginsu commercial aired, countless products have been sold with, if not the exact words, certainly the implication of, but wait, there's more. But here's the thing, long before the Ginsu knife was ever dreamed of, our God was, as the prophet Isaiah proclaimed, making all things new. And long before the infomercials took up the cry of convincing us to buy things we don't need, God called us to a new mission, inviting us to write the vision so that a runner could read it. And Jesus tells us, oh, and when you go, don't go alone. Pack light. Offer peace to those in whom, whose homes you dwell. Don't move around too much, chasing after this and that. Be hospitable, eating what is put before you. Cure the sick. And if peace is not possible, wipe the dust from your shoes and move on but always remind those that you meet that the realm of God is near. Jesus' very life was about doing a new thing. And Jesus knew that in any given situation, God was going to do a new thing. And with that new thing, there would be more, so much more. For you see, when the storm had raged for 40 days and nights, and all that could be seen was water, God said to Noah, but wait, there's more. And when the people wandered in the wilderness for 40 years and death was all around them, God said, but wait, there's more. And when Ruth and Naomi were left with nothing but their love for each other to sustain them, God said, but wait, there's more. And when David lost Jonathan, the man he loved more than a woman, God said, but wait, there is more. When Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, God said, but wait, there's more. When Mary found herself pregnant out of wedlock, God said, but wait, there's more. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness and again at Gethsemane, God said, but wait, there's more. When Jesus hung dying on a cross and commended his spirit, God said, but wait, there's more. And on that great getting up morning, when the living risen Christ was raised from the dead, God said, but wait, there's more.
And on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came in wind and fire, God said, but wait, there's more. And in 1957, when faithful people formed a united and uniting church, God said, but wait, there's more. And in 1999, when those same faithful people gathered in General Senate in Providence, Rhode Island, and voted to change their governance from instrumentalities to four covenanted ministries, God said, but wait, there's more. And tonight, as we honor our past and commit to our mission and step out in faith in a new way of governing and of delivering our message, our God is still saying to us, but wait, there's more. And oh, by the way, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, no matter your hope, no matter your heartache, no matter the good you've done or the way you failed, no matter what you've done or left undone, God is saying to you, but wait, there's more. And at the end of days, when evil is overcome and falls from the sky like lightning, and the realm of God is on earth as it is in heaven, and all that was has passed away, and there is a new heaven and a new earth. Listen carefully because, my friends, you will hear God say yet again, but wait, there's more. There is more hope. There is more peace. There is more light. There is more life. There is more love. Do you not perceive it? I am doing a new thing. So let us hold fast to our mission in following Jesus our Christ. Let us step boldly into the future, guided by the power of the Holy Spirit. And let us listen for the voice of our, our God calling us forth out into the world to witness to Jerusalem, Judea, and all of Samaria, and to the ends of the earth to be witnesses to our still speaking God who is always saying, but wait, there's more. Hallelujah.